this first year. Well, I, I will quickly start to, to tell you what I will talk about in the next minutes, and then I will tell you what he will maybe do in the afternoon. So, my talk will not be necessarily very technical. I mean, we are kind of more or less a lot of entrepreneurship. Um, technical aspects are for those who uh, worked yesterday and the day before. And then I will end with um, some ideas on the different business models we will see. And then in the afternoon, Harold will continue with. <laughs> yeah, I will give you a brief introduction to uh, the idea of being an entrepreneur in university. And then we blend over to um, a teaching environment we created here for entrepreneurship. Uh, it's an online um, module, you can say, and I will use one of our uh, lecture units in order to introduce you what is called the Business Model Canva. Those who are familiar with entrepreneurship most likely know about the Business Model Canva. And then we will ask a question to you, and we would like to hand over also a little bit of uh, responsibility of thinking to you. Uh, the question is, is the web and entrepreneurship with and on the web something different compared to normal traditional entrepreneurship? And I think you've got a lot of, um, let's say, impulses uh, over this academy the last days. We listened to a lot of examples like Salo was presented to you. Is it something different or is it just um, you know, a copy from the real world into the virtual world? This will be our question and we are excited to get you uh, into our thinking mode. So I will do this in the afternoon and start with it, but I will still at my side. <laughs> uh, and support. So I hand over to you, Mario, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Well, the slides are all there yet? Yes, we have. They're ongoing. Well, actually, I do not really need the slides for the talk, but in particular, the first slide could be great because I need <laughs> I needed to do my, my look because I decided not to start in German way. You know, Germans usually start a presentation with, well, my name is Mario, and this is my agenda. Bam, 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 bam. And then I tell you, in the American way, I mean, um, we have a uh, guest from America here, usually start with a hook, with a nice story of what went wrong, or what, what, what went quite well. And if you look at this, some of us. <laughs> <laughs> It's on. <laughs> this is not web science. This is <laughs> I'm sorry, it's my fault. Um, yeah, thirty plus people looking at you, making you nervous.
So we have companies such as Foodora, which they, they took really an incredible simple idea, just going to restaurants with the food delivery, take the food as you ordered it, and bring it to you. So they do not build their own food, they do not make it, they do not cook, they do not have employees in the typical sense. They use people, students with a bike. And even those people who have to, have to bring their own bikes and their own smartphone, their cell phone to uh, interact with Fudora. So actually, simple idea but only happening because the web is enabling everything. And on the other hand, why is it profitable? I mean, they charge in Germany, I don't know if uh, they charge in other countries, 2 euros 90 cents per delivery. And even that would not be enough for um, profit, but they have a nice algorithm in the back and they try to have two orders at least uh, going um, over, over one person who delivers it. And so they have actually um, a double price per, uh, per offer. So, other examples are Liverando, also pretty simple. You go to a website and order your food and they do not really deliver it, so they work with restaurants who do deliver. And another topic you know maybe is Open Table, or there are several other companies who do reservation services for restaurants. Again, incredibly simple. I mean, you have booked so many restaurant tables in your life, you just phone your, your favorite restaurant and that's it. So why should you use an online tool? So for us, it's really a simple idea. But for the merchants, it's changing the world. Because with the net, you get uh, information about who makes a reservation. So if Harold has paid 200 bucks the last time he visited the restaurant, then if he orders next time and makes a reservation by open table, for example, the restaurant knows, oh, well, that's Harold. Uh, let's give him the best place so that he makes a revenue again of more than 200 bucks. So there's a lot of things happening, and um, I think all those systems have the potential to turn established businesses up and down. This is actually where we are pretty close to the word entre web entrepreneurship. Another example is again this on a reservation of restaurants. Here, Kornu, which was actually founded by a student of the University of Copenhagen, Landau, is uh, located in Berlin, three years old uh, approximately. And look at the figures. They have a plus 117 percent in terms of um, restaurants they work with. 266 percent more in terms of seated dinners and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things going on. You do both. And they sold the company about a year ago for two hundred million dollars. Quite okay for a company based on a pretty simple idea, which doesn't mean that it's simple around the business. It's just the idea that is simple. And as you know, we have a lot of other things going on there, and um, more or less established businesses like Airbnb, which changed how we use accommodation today. Moringa, which makes relocation services. Uh, this is in Germany, in a particular case in the United States, we have a probably quite active bus infrastructure, which we didn't have in, in Germany until two years ago because of state regulations. Now we have it, and there are several um, offerings for, for bus routes. And we know Groupon, the company I work for for, for a while, and even Dog Park, they do. Um, there are really good places for marinas, so if you have really, really uh, a lot of money and on your own ship and you go from harbor to harbor, um, usually it's not really uh, that you can do it by the map or only with particular harbors, and they made it to a different level, so you only interact with um, Dokwa and get your, your uh, locations for a better price. And you know the more two ones like Zalando or Amazon, all those could be considered as web startups. So what is web entrepreneurship? Usually in such a lecture or in such a speak you would give a definition. Unfortunately there is no real definition of web entrepreneurship. Actually it's a word termed by the European Union and they created it during a Horizon 2020 proposal where they 
where they search for web entrepreneurship. Outside of the European Union, you can Google it. You will not find that much under the term web entrepreneurship. Maybe if you type in web startups, then it will come things more about it. But this is interesting because actually we see a whole industry emerging in the web with new business models, with new ideas, and a term that describes it quite well, web entrepreneurship, doesn't have a real definition. Here's one of those projects who actually got funding from this uh, Horizon 2020 core. And this is one of the few things I found um, when I searched for entrepreneurship. <coughs> so, why is web entrepreneurship different? So, maybe there's no need for a definition. Maybe it's the same as a model entrepreneurship model style. So, first of all, where is it different? You could ask, well, it's about user involvement. Users are getting more involved than in traditional service, uh, in traditional businesses. Another aspect is scalability. Because with the web, we all know that, <laughs> you can reach thousands of people and you can uh, grow faster than conventional businesses. Is it the business model? So is it what you do? But look at Amazon. They did not really change the business model at the beginning. They just sold books, which bookstores also did. So the business model as such, depending on the definition of what business model is, we'll come to this later, is also maybe not that really different. Is it the content? Is it what we are doing? It's also not that easy. And this is where it's getting interactive. Let's say in five minutes, maybe one or two minutes, um, talk to your to your colleague or your neighbor, and then we will collect two or three opinions for where you think web entrepreneurship, so startups in the web, building a startup is different from conventional startups. It doesn't have to be five minutes. Let's say a minute where you can talk with your colleague. Maybe. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your discussion, for your discussion. So, you can, you can, yeah, <laughs> sit where you are right now. So, give me some examples. What do you think? Is it different from a traditional business, or is it the same? What do you think, Fabi? Yeah, traditional business, there's a lot of excitement. There's much more users. Mm -hmm. And you have different websites about it. Okay, but we will come to the point later. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, that's a point. And it's true that much of the entrepreneurship in the web is a completely different because in the web means creative team, like the green team, and also singular, all people doing their work life balance. And I guess the risk of flaws is uh, not the risk, but the amount of flaws is smaller if you make entrepreneurship in the web uh, than like in, um, uh, in the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, number of police can be less, sure. We know this from WhatsApp, for example, a pretty small company. Did you want to add something? No. <laughs> yeah, in many cases, yeah. <laughs> I mean, coming to the Fudora example again, five years ago, some students from another university located here, private school, they had a quite similar idea. So they said, well, look at hotels. They all have uh, a kitchen. And usually they have, um, yeah, they are not really productive in the sense that then if they have eight guests per evening, well, they could, could sell more. So let's go to them and make it online and collect it. Um, but then, at that time, 
well, smartphones were not that yeah, widely spread on, as it is now, and they, they skipped the idea. Well, it's also a matter of timing, but you're right in a way that it's, um, yeah. What did, you, what did you want to add? It's in, in many, many ways, it's cheaper, but, and uh, this is something we can talk about this afternoon, it's cheaper for whom? Well, you talk about people, so can you be right with your app and people be there and you... Yeah, maybe, but uh, if we, we heard about social entrepreneurship. Is it social to let uh, the poor students uh, go with a bike collecting food somewhere for a minimum wage? Is it, is it fair? We can, we can discuss about that later on. So, first of all, we got a sense that maybe there is something different. And this is what I, I think also, but still, we do not have really an accepted definition of what web entrepreneurship is. So, we asked the question ourselves, and we did some research on it. And I know some of you are PhDs, more or less in the computer science area, I guess. Who do, do, is doing a PhD? Raise your hands, please. Well, the majority, yeah. So, we did not do this um, in the computer science way. We did it traditionally with um, some experiments, some web experiments. And we were asking ourselves, why do people book online a restaurant? I mean, you have the phone available. Uh, you know your favorite places. Maybe you, you um, say him by his first name. So we thought that also involvement in the booking process means responsibility. Because if you're uh, on a web, or even your smartphone and your book, it's your responsibility to choose the right time and everything else. Whereas if you um, call someone, you can blame him if something is going wrong with your reservation, right? And this is what we were thinking about, and uh, then we said, well, actually there's a higher risk somehow in uh, booking online. So actually people should not do it because the risk is higher in terms of the higher involvement but also maybe it's more useful because it's somehow convenient. Yeah? Phones, sometimes you have to wait in f uh, waiting loops, yeah? if you have your phone calls. Sometimes um, the restaurant is closed, you cannot call someone. And we wanted to look how the involvement of the booking process affects perceived risk and usefulness. And this is a typical model how a management researcher would, would research something. So we had our experimental factors, so we built four groups, one who were given a scenario, it was a web-based survey, where they said, please imagine you, book about, uh, you are going about to book a, a table in your favorite restaurant, and the other was online, and then service complexity, where we did a pretest, which services people perceive as complex versus simple. And we found out that restaurants are perceived as a quite simple services, whereas a dentist, which you also could book online in while in many, many areas, was quite complex. And we were looking at how it perceived, uh, how it affected perceived risk, and subsequently the intention to use such a system, meaning the phone or um, the online tool. And then we had two moderators, and this is actually what we were mostly interested in. What about people who had kind of attitude towards something? So some of us, they have attitude towards web. We all have it because we're here, yeah? we like the web. But maybe some people, especially older people, are quite uh, skeptic to use it. And some of us really want to interact with an employee. Imagine an old woman alone in the home, maybe she wants to talk to someone, right? And this were our moderators, meaning that we think that the uh, effect of the experimental factors on perceived risk is moderated, meaning different for people who have high or low attitudes towards the reservation. So this, this is uh, our hypothesis we had. I don't want to go too much into detail because I know you're more or less web science students or computer uh, science students and now uh, management students, but for example, we had one hypothesis, meaning a high involvement in the booking process in terms of the online booking compared to the phone uh, reservation will negatively affect the intention to use the booking system. And we had a lot of those hypotheses which we tested. Again, I will not go too much into detail. We'll show you the main results of it. First of all, as always, you did a um, literature analysis. We did then an online survey and we had a pre-study. And this is interesting because 
yesterday you heard a lot of about crowdsourcing. It's also a great way to use it for surveys, not for representative ones. This is dangerous. Yeah? So you cannot survey Amazon Mechanical Turk people if you want to know um, about social change in, <laughs> in a culture or something like this, because this is an online population. But for pretests, and if you're interested in an online population, this is often <laughs> a nice way to do it because it's cheap and it's really, really fast. You get answers within an hour from 200, 300 people where you, as a researcher, normally wait uh, weeks for if you do it the traditional way, going paper and pencil surveys, for example, um, with your students for that. So you, as a PhD student, if you want to run pretests, it's a great idea. Use it. Okay, so we had this pretest with 72 respondents, and they had to group a couple of services from, again, simple to complex. And this is how we got our information of what is more complex, dentist or um, a restaurant. And you would think, well, sure, a restaurant is not as a complex service. You just have to serve the food. Dentist is a little more complex. But in an experiment, you have to be sure that it really is as you think. And this is why we did this pretest. And then we had a main survey. Again, this was a web survey, but not with Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we used students' uh, accounts and approached their networks. But they were intentionally um, advised to contact older people as well. So it's not a real student and not an online sample with young people. There are also older ones present. And we did a so-called scenario-based between-group experimental design. So we had these four groups. Yeah, one is online, and then dentist and restaurant, and the other is phone, dentist and restaurant. And we got 282 respondents, or responses from these people. Here again, our experimental design. And we checked if people really perceived the service complexity and the involvement as different with questions after they got um, the scenario. And we, sh we, we saw that it's, it's true. So these are the results from an ANOVA. You are pretty familiar with this, I guess, um, simply testing for uh, a difference in the mean and a difference in the variance. And where we can see a star, there is a difference. C means complexity and I means involvement. We were more interested in involvement and we see that between dentists and restaurants there is a difference, first of all, in intention to use, not in the perceived usefulness, but also in the booking risk, there's a huge difference between the online and the um, yeah, phone group. And, and this is what I think is the most interesting uh, finding in this small, it's really a small paper and a small study, is the difference in terms of the moderation. And we see here that the moderator attitudes toward online reservation, this means A-T-O-R, small spelling there, if it's low, which is the dotted line, there you can see a difference between phone and online. And if the attitude is high, there is no difference. And my question to you, again, we told you that a little bit thinking from your side is required. Imagine you run a restaurant. Yeah? What would you do with this result? What would you learn from this finding that obviously there is a difference in the two groups of being high or low um, people with attitudes toward online reservation. You can think about it uh, a minute, and you can ask me questions if I didn't explain it correctly. But this is my um, yeah, exercise for you for the next minute. I think what do you mean? The moderator, an attitude towards online reservation is the moderator, so meaning that, what do you mean? Yeah, so if you have a, this is a continuous variable from uh, one to seven, people could rate how they think, uh, how important, or how their attitude towards online rating is, and then it's no more a, a mean comparison. You make a mean, and everything, what is uh, one standard deviation above or below it is high or low. Um, this is how it is captured there. Uh, 
Ja. Again, please. My open register. Yeah. And my RAM is not that high. I took it to take that photo of the people and see the location of that stuff. Interesting one. I have to think about it. I can't give you an answer directly, but we will collect other opinions first, yeah? Well, in my opinion, there is not much you can learn from it. In my opinion, actually, there's only one thing you can learn from it. But um, what do you have for ideas? That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, it's also very true. That, that's also a very good strategy, but this was not about ratings so much. We come to ratings uh, in a minute. Well, actually, what you can learn from it, and I, I told you it's not really much, it's it does not really make sense to target people with a low attitude to online reservations, right? So they perceive the risk as much higher. So if you have a limited marketing budget, which you usually have as a small merchant somewhere in a town, it only makes sense to target those who have a high attitude towards online reservations. So you can ask people, for example, quite simple, as some car companies do that. If you bring your car to, uh, to work, car workshop is it called, right? The, um, where you can repair your car. It's a car workshop, right? So you bring it to them, and two days after, they call you and ask you how satisfied you were with everything. So in a similar way, you could ask people who came to your um, company or your, to your restaurant, and you can ask them, well, how is your attitude toward honor reservation? Would you do that? And then you could target them with uh, different offerings because they are more likely to use the system later on because they perceive the risk as lower. Simple thing. Why I tell you this? This means that even traditional services, such as a restaurant service, are heavily affected by web entrepreneurship. They have to change a lot of things if they want to participate and benefit from the web. And this you have to keep in mind if you build your own web company, which is working together with a low-tech area, this, that you have to somehow consult them and somehow uh, educate, them, uh, educate them to work with your system and use it correctly. Yeah? I have a question. Is that an opinion? Yeah. So you started as a company and you yeah. were really into the car and you just got a product. Oh, really? And you haven't thought about this. So that's why you got lost. So you started as an online company. You delivered targeted products to the people, only people who, who want targeted products. Yeah. So that's why this is a very important factor. Great example. Thank you for this. We can talk about that later. I'm really interested in that. Well, yeah, another example. We are still in the example phase. Oh, sorry, Fabi. The previous, previous side. This one. What do you mean? C was complexity, meaning that the difference between... Um, reservation for a dentist and the reservation for a restaurant. And you can see that there's not much of a difference, only in booking risk, but only a small one. So it doesn't really matter what you're booking. It's really more a matter of um, how you have your attitude toward online booking. 
Because at the beginning, we thought that it's the difference between booking a complex services, uh, service versus um, yeah, booking a, a rather simple service. But as we could see, the difference was not really there, yeah, except for the booking risk. And even there, it was a small on a 5% uh, level. Yeah. So in the recapturing it, we could have skipped the pretest on what is more complex. But you never know before you uh, do your, your analysis and your study, right? OK, coming to another phenomenon, and this is user ratings, as you <laughs> already mentioned. Uh, and this is here for physicians and dentists and everything. It's Gameda, it's a German platform, but I'm pretty sure that in uh, every country you come from, there are similar platforms because they are emerging. Yeah? You can search for the doctor, and this is often necessary because you don't know all those people. And then we were looking at what the um, rating, or how the rating is important compared to other factors. So we manipulated two of the profiles of the same doctor. So we kept the picture the same, we kept the name the same, but we changed the um, number ratings and the uh, text-based ratings. And then we gave them to a, a eye-tracking service because we wanted to be sure that people look similar to a high reputation profile and a low reputation profile. Yeah? We, needed, we needed this to um, trust our results later on because if we did not do that, someone could argue, well, maybe people look only at the numbers in the one area and do not really read the taxes. But it was the, the, um, the view, the, the, um, yeah, the eye tracking movement was nearly similar in both, in both cases. Okay, so we had two, actually we had three, <laughs> I'm only showing two, we had three of the different profiles with different ratings. And they all were realistic ratings, so it's not that we were given a six or something, which in Germany is really bad in the German system. Uh, we used values really existed. And then we, yeah, again, made an experiment where we showed people three of these um, uh, different Profiles, and we asked for a couple of, of things. For example, for how reputable they think the uh, physician is. For age, gender, how they use the internet, um, how often they go to a doctor, how often they search for it, um, how they think how credible this uh, platform is, multiple things. And as you can see, the only thing which was really affecting the intention to make an appointment later on was the rating which is actually not really surprising. Surprising is more that many of those other variables did not have an effect. This is actually the more surprising finding, not that the uh, rating has an effect. And what we also could see is that the attitude towards usage still has an effect, as we saw in the example of the reservation, but not the sole one. Again, it's the, uh, it's the one about the profile. And then we did a mediation. Mediation means that an effect is um, yeah, mediated through a third variable. And there we say, saw that actually it's really, as we thought, it's the reputation. So a high profile signals a high reputation, which is not really surprising, but we had to control for it. And it's the reputation that actually make the intention to make an honor reservation. So far, so good, but if you look at the implications, so you could say, well, a better profile is good, right? But first of all, does it really guarantee you more patients? What do you think? On what, please? On the demand. Good point, very good point. Other comments? Right, very, very good, and this is not captured by the platform. You know. <laughs> yeah, and, and finally, do you want those patients? I mean, in Germany, we have the difference between a private insurance and a state insurance, a compulsory one. So we know many of those uh, doctors do not want those patients, and this makes new challenges. If you go to your meta, you can click on available appointments. 
you can book directly. And you see a left one and a right one for private insurance and state insurance. <laughs> Imagine, and blue means uh, uh, appointment is available. Imagine which one is for which type of insurance. Private is in the right. True and not true. This is the only, the only case I found where a doctor had more options available for state uh, insurance than for private ones. In all other cases, really it is as you imagined, you have more options available for private insurance people. In Copeland's, I search for only for Copeland's doctors. Sorry, I have to, uh, um, forgot to admit that. <laughs> well, yeah, but the interesting thing is, I don't know if all those people, and this is one of the studies we're trying to do next, um, how this affects how you um, see the doctor and how likely it is that you book uh, online and if you book at all. So if you see that someone prefers high price uh, patients, maybe you do not want to go to this doctor. So we have lots of new challenges with our new business models in the area of, of web entrepreneurship. Okay, a brief summary. So we saw we don't have any accepted definition of what web entrepreneurship actually is. We have many new business models which are based on web applications. Well, we can't um, agree on that. Use integration rating systems are somehow important. We have many, many new phenomena. As I told you, you have to work with uh, quite traditional businesses, for example. Yeah. And finally, it's more than simply selling something over the net or via internet, which many people tell, tell you when they um, talk about web entrepreneurship, right? Okay. Well, if we talk about web entrepreneurship, we also have to uh, talk for some moments about entrepreneurship as such. Uh, this is actually something Harold could explain better, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, my, it's my part here. And I want to start with a story. Pavi, you may know the story because you attended one of my courses, but who of you does know Frederick W. Smith? Jim, you are not allowed to answer. <laughs> who knows? Just raising your hand. One. Usually in a German class, no one raises their hand. So Frederick, he, his father was quite rich, and um, he inherited his father's affluence and he got $10 million inheritance. But he wanted to found a company. And I mean, if I got 10 million, I would know what, what to do. I would go surfing and uh, clubbing and, and make holiday in Tuscany or wherever. So he, Frederick, did different. He needed more capital than this 10 million to get his company off the ground. And this is different from web entrepreneurship because this way of founding a company is quite um, capital intense. He founded FedEx, and FedEx more or less is familiar to all of, all of you. Some brief um, yeah, information about the story, how it came to FedEx. So one of the professors of Smith classes, um, I think it was in Yale in the 60s, was a support of the air freight handling, meaning that cargo packages could only be transported at night when unused um, yeah, space was, was available. So he was thinking, Fred, of a freight-only airline, which was not there in the 60s. And he said, well, goods would be distributed and flown out again to the destination, and the, the operation could take place at night, and the company would need a duplicate investment because before you send your first package, you need a kind of infrastructure, and this is why it's quite capital intense. And here on the Sea Force paper. <laughs> Do you know the story? Or? Yeah, but, but this was um, maybe the most funniest thing. So don't trust me if I give you a C or a D, you can still become millionaires. Yeah? Okay, the challenge, well, as web entrepreneurship, um, many of the successes started in a garage. Yeah? Let's go to Steve Jobs or Microsoft. This is different. And he needed a nationwide distribution system, a complete fleet of airplanes and trucks before accepting his first order, yeah. at least technical. Um, well, 
I will not go through, through everything, you get the slides. At the end, he got 71 million from venture capitalists, which at that time was the largest venture capital startup in the history of American businesses. I'm not quite sure if uh, MasterCard, no, not MasterCard, um, Facebook later on was uh, bigger, right? Um, don't, <laughs> yeah, I have to look it up. But at that time, still until uh, 2005, it was the um, largest venture capital startup in the history. And one month after the official startup, he was shipping 186 packages to 25 destinations, which is not really much. But if you look at the figures today, this is from 2005, but I look it up, today we have um, $47 billion in revenue for, um, for the FedEx example. I told you this because I want to motivate again for what is entrepreneurship actually. And here, at the heart of Smith's success story is more something of a creativity and the uniqueness of the initial business concept. And the uniqueness is something usually entrepreneurship professors were telling for decades. Which again, if you look at the examples of web entrepreneurship, is it really unique to sell books online or to collect food somewhere. Another aspect of where I think web entrepreneurship is different because the uniqueness is not that important. Other aspects are more important than uniqueness, in my opinion, but you can have other opinions on that. Yeah, what is entrepreneurship? Well, it comes from the uh, French word, as you may know, and today's meaning is more or less the process of planning, organizing, operating, assuming the risk of a business venture. And uh, yeah, we have, um, <coughs> Some additional meanings, for example, that entrepreneurs, they also must think tactically and strategically and uh, act in that way. It's also a big business, entrepreneurship. Uh, in Germany, it's really growing over the last five to 10 years, I would say. <coughs> Here, as of 2013, 600 to 800,000 new companies in the US. And as this source said, no sector of the US and world economy has been little dynamic and creative as entrepreneurship. And here are some few examples. Usually, as you may know, being an entrepreneur, you have your ups and downs. Yeah, you have an idea, and it goes to uh, ecstasy in terms of enthusiasm when it works and it doesn't work. And um, you also have to cope with different um, ups and downs, which is normal for this area of entrepreneurship. Well, why do you become entrepreneur? I mean, there's large, 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 large research on that um, with surveys and, and um, yeah, different um, ways of capturing why people started. Often, it's the loss of current employment. This is typical for people working in industrial areas who are 48, 50, 52. As a professor, this is uh, the best time you can have <laughs> because you usually have a great team at that time. But being in business, 48, 50, 52, it's more or less uh, the time where you have to say goodbye sometimes. And many of them in the industrial area found their own companies then. Uh, we here are a younger group, more or less. So we have maybe other areas, where, uh, other reasons. So independence and freedom, yeah. being able to do our own thing, because um, actually this is the reason why I wanted to become a professor, because a professor you also can do more or less your own thing, at least to a certain degree. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah, then we have different types of entrepreneurs, and um, this is the next question I, will, I would like to give you. So we have the serial entrepreneur, someone who starts, grows, and sells several businesses over the course of their career. Last week, I met some of these guys who uh, founded Seven Load. This was a video platform in, in Germany. Then he had an incredibly simple idea called cv.com in Germany, lebenslauf.de, where you simply can use a web interface and it's a, build a PDF or the web interface where you can type in your own CV. And he sold it to Xing, which is a competitor of LinkedIn, for 850,000. Uh, uh, euros, euros it was. It's not a big deal as Facebook, but 850,000 is still a lot for a simple technique. And why did Xing use it? They use it because you only can use the system if you 
uh, register on the Google Sync platform as, and it's a cheap way for them to get new, uh, <laughs> yeah, new registrants and show their investors, well, our platform is growing. <laughs> okay. Then another type would be the aspiring entrepreneur, so someone who is dreaming of starting a business. And um, research here indicates that at any given time, 7 million adults start a business in the United States. Another one is the lifestyle entrepreneur, which, in my opinion, is coming more popular. People really like to be entrepreneur. If you go to your friends and then tell them what you are doing, they like to say, well, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, here, 30 million Americans run their own businesses it included part-time, it's, it's even higher from their home. And fourth, the growth entrepreneur. And this is actually the more, most intense type of entrepreneurship. Yeah. Have the desire and the ability to grow as fast and as large as possible. If you look at Groupon, at Facebook, at Google, growth from the first beginning was a goal, which is not true for, for any um, entrepreneurship. Okay, we're past, past 11, some minutes left. Yeah, ask yourself, what type am I? This is not a question we have to answer now, maybe in the afternoon, but um, <laughs> could you see some of your um, yeah, personality traits here or not, the type of entrepreneurs? If you also talk, and again, we're jumping from web entrepreneurship, from entrepreneurship to business here, uh, the business model, a term which is quite often used, but again, well, there are definitions in, in contrast to web entrepreneurship, but there are so many that it's, <laughs> again, not that easy to find one which is quite feasible. So here's one. So business model can be an architecture for the product, service, and information flows, including a description of the various business actors and the roles, a description of the potential benefits for the various business actors, and a description of the sources of revenues. This is actually one of the most important aspects. If you look at all those definitions on business models, I would say in 85% you will find a revenue model as a sub part of it. Yeah? I can't see you well because the window is open. Sorry. Yeah, there is one, one initiative by the University of St. Gallen, and they have the so-called business model navigator, and they looked at the history of more or less all <laughs> possible business models you ever could see, and derivations of that. And they found 53 archetypes of different business models. And uh, it's, yeah, again, they called the St. Gallen business model navigator. If you look for that, you can see more or less a structured way, but it's not as structured as a semantic web would be. Yeah. Okay, here, example, eBay. Maybe it's not the best example because it's getting old, but um, quite well known. So actually, they do nothing else than acquisition and bargaining of business transactions and online auctions. They have no own products. As I said, Facebook, for example, has no own media. Uber has no own cars. Airbnb has no own rooms or apartments. And still, all those things are quite successful. Some of these uh, areas would uh, refer to the sharing economy. In other words, it is quite often used in this area. But if you look at the business model more particularly, you have these three building blocks. And in the afternoon, Harold will continue with the business model. I always say canvas. You say Canva. I don't know what actually the right word is. Jim, maybe you can help us out. Is it a canvas or a Canva? The business model canvas? Canvas, with an S, right? Or, okay, thank you. Um, so we have a value proposition. And this is not the business model canvas. You will <laughs> learn about that uh, this afternoon. So what value does the firm offer for customers or for other firms? This is one question you would ask there. The value generation architecture, so how is that value generated? And the third building block is the revenue model so how do we generate the money and who is paying for the value? 
These are three basic blocks, which you will also find in the business model canvas, but the business model canvas is more extended, has some more features. So look at eBay again. So what kind of value does eBay actually deliver? And well, we know PayPal, and PayPal is uh, belonging to, um, to eBay and is quite successful, but skip, skip, skip to PayPal, actually eBay does not really do the payments except for PayPal. And they do not really do the logistics. Yeah, it's really a small part between buyer and seller. And this has to do with, um, with uh, value chains where you really position yourself. And you see so many, <laughs> so many value chains where some part is not really captured by someone, where you could find opportunities to grow your own business. Again, look at the example of Foodora, collecting food from companies who do not, uh, from restaurants who do not deliver. If you look at the whole value chain, there is someone who is collecting the food himself. I, every Sunday, have to go to a restaurant for my wife because she wants the salad from this restaurant. I have to drive 10 kilometers and then pick it up. So I do the job. But it doesn't have to be like that. Yeah? And if you look at value chains, there's so many parts of an entire value chain where you can add a business, and especially with the support of the web. Yeah, again, we have here the value proposition, so it's more or less a bargaining. It's mediated by the platform. Logistics and payment is done with the partners, and customers can be sellers and buyers, and this is a first hint for our next part, has to do with uh, two-sided markets, which I come to in a minute. And uh, to the revenue, well, the revenue is exclusively generated with sellers, which um, doesn't have to be like that. You can charge other people for this. And yeah, it's quite a complex fee system, which actually is the, the reason why they're not successful anymore, it was getting too complex at some time. And they got additional revenue from PayPal, but um, they separated it from the main thing. Coming to multi-sided platform, this is Typical economics, and we heard from this morning, Simon, as he explained how he de generated his money. He actually uh, spoke of a triangle. The more economic term would be a two-sided or a multi-sided platform, where you have different markets, a market side one and a market side two, and you have barely a direct interaction. Usually you have the interaction via the platform. And this is typical for almost every web startup, almost. Maybe we can find some, some startups where it's not like this. But um, think of some examples. Become, uh, before we come to these examples, I would like to introduce you two effects from networks. Fabi, you were writing uh, exactly in this area your, your thesis, right? Yeah? On, on the neutral nets and so on. So here we have two effects. One is the same side network effect, and then we have the cross-site network effect. And the cross-site network effect is the one who's really interesting when it comes to web entrepreneurship. For example, we have same-site effects. A positive one is if we have more players, for example, for an online game. Um, so we have more online interaction. This is a same-site network effect. Everyone benefits because we have more players and the interaction rate. Negative would be we have maybe more sellers in our market and have more competition. A cross-site effect would be um, that we have more games available to players. Imagine the uh, PlayStation 4 or 5, I don't know what the uh, current number is. Is it 5 still out? 4, huh? 4. Okay. Maybe you know that they sell the PlayStation below the price they would have to charge compared to what they pay for the production of the system. Uh, because then they enable a two-sided market, and this is why the games are so expensive. And this is a typical cross-side, uh, for them a positive, for you actually a negative one, a positive cross-side network effect. And that's not easy to install those effects. For example, Netscape, you all know this was a company active uh, until 2001, I guess, and the Mozilla browser emerged from the Netscape Navigator um, problem, and they did not really tie the, the browser to any server, which IBM with, later on, Apache and their own web servers did quite well, and Netscape did not. And this is also an um, example where uh, a cross-site effect did not really emerge. 
because it was not really tight. Another thing which is not easy to understand is the chicken or egg problem in network effects in general. So the supply side won't engage until there is sufficient volume on the demand side and vice versa. This is also known as a cross-site network effect. And this is also important if you look at the first, uh, let's say Facebook or here, we had who knows who. These two guys from Copeland's founded a company here which was almost similar in size in Germany in 2007. Same functionality as Facebook. And they got funding from venture capitalists based on the registered people. But at that time, you really got funding for registered people, ignoring that 98% of those people are not really active below just clicking in, reading some news, and, and going. And Facebook was clever enough to understand that it's not really registered people, it's the activity on the platform. Right? So if you have enough people and you have the activity, then uh, everything is going. And this is, again, called the uh, chicken or egg problem. Whether it's a chicken and egg uh, problem or a chicken or egg problem depends on whether participation adjusts more rapidly downward toward an equilibrium or upward. This is a more economic way of pronouncing it. The next thing in <laughs> web entrepreneurship is the pricing. How do you price your offerings? And typically, you have this, uh, this graph here where you have the price and the quantity. And if you have many things to sell, usually the price goes down. And if you have a low quantity, uh, let's say a Rolex uh, watch, then the price goes up. And this is what this uh, figure should illustrate. And then you have a rectangle under this curve. And usually you would say, look for the biggest rectangle under the, in the, under the demand curve. And minimum is the marginal cost per unit. You usually do not want to sell below what it costs to produce something, except you're in a two-sided market. And the maximum usually is the customer's willingness to buy something. Yeah? But it's not really easy to find this customer's willingness to pay or to buy something because all often um, dependent on the situation. Well, if you have a two-sided market, you can, to do th you can do two things. First of all, you can independently maximize each market. Yeah? The customer market or the business side. We have a different curve for it, and you would try to maximize each of the rectangles. On the other hand, you can do quantity uh, and price comparison in collectively maximizing both markets, the customer market and the business side. If you lower the price for the consumer part, again, this is what the PlayStation does. And if you look at open source, actually, it's an extreme way of this one because you price it at zero. Yeah, and try to do um, your money or make your money with the business side. Of course, open source depends on which business model you have and which types of software we're talking about. But if you look at uh, additional services, for example, you more or less, again, have a two-sided market. You have the open source developers, develop it more or less for free, but you still have another business market where people are paying for additional services. But it's getting too complex. Open source would be a more complex figure than this. But in theory, open source is nothing else than lowering the price to zero in the left part. Examples. This is a discotheque in Siena, Italy. Why is this an example for a two-sided market? What do you think? Could be, could be. Actually, completely right, but it's not the reason why I put it there, but you're right. There's another reason. I give you a hint, maybe a girl should answer the question. Girls get in for free, and men pay. A typical two-sided market approach. Because you raise the demand by having lots of girls, and usually we as, as men are going to discotheque to, to meet girls, to, 
to sell, yeah, maybe to find our wives, some of us, want to have fun. So you get in, or let, let one group in for, for, for low, and you charge the other group. It's, again, a two-sided market, not a web-based, but if you look at portals like um, internet um, platforms where you find data, uh, internet dating platforms, it's more or less a similar thing. You pay more and you're male compared to being a female. Again, give women free admission, so more men pay charge and alcohol oftentimes. And another th example is news. Why is news an example of a newspaper, an example of a two-sided market? Right. But here, usually you still pay a price for the product. Let's say one euro forty or two or three euros for the paper as such. And what Facebook did in terms of markets was nothing else than lowering the price for the offer to zero and only charge the advertising because they could have deliver more value. A newspaper is spread to millions of people but you never know if your advertisement of, let's say, chairs will reach the right person. You will have 89% people who read it but are not interested in a chair. And this is why Facebook is uh, successful, because they know to whom they send the chair advertisement. So they have a higher rate uh, of um, return. Um, again, this is also an example of a two-sided platform. So low price for the newspaper, more readers, and then you can have higher prices for advertising. This worked quite well until <laughs> the web started to grow. Yeah, and um, those companies are in trouble in, in many, many areas. So some more examples, but we do not have to go through that in detail. Credit card, uh, dating agency, free TV, and so on and so forth. I will end my talk with some things. We will not go too much into detail. I just want to show you that it's possible to model those things to find better prices. But this is not something we really developed in this course right now, and it's maybe too difficult to do it in the last uh, five to ten minutes. I will just show you it and maybe to give one example. So here is um, some introduction on, on network platforms, and this has to do with development platforms. Look at Apple, Apple iOS, or Android. You can develop for Android your apps, but Android is charging you a little. And then it's often the, the, the question as a platform operator, how much do you charge from the um, developers and how much do you charge people who really use the app, right? Um, difficult topic. So we have here in the middle, we have the application service developers and we have the consumers as two parts of this two-sided market. And usually we have a platform infrastructure, which is here called app. Then we have the service providers, and we have different users. And here are some indicators. So BD is more or less the price um, you charge the service providers, and PC is the price you charge the users. And yeah, depending on the number, uh, which is ND or XC of um, service providers and the number of users, you can try to look how you can maximize um, your platform infrastructure. And we know that it works quite well. If you look at figures here from Statista, Google Play and Apple App Store have uh, 90, 29 to 31, um, what is it, billion, yeah, billion downloads from their app stores. So typically we have two different choices. So we can have a minimalist design. So um, it's quasi cheap to build, but less attractive to developers. Yeah, you give them basic functionalities. You don't really put too much investment in your own infrastructure. Again, we are in the position of a platform operator right now. Yeah? The one who is sitting here below. Or you make a rich design. You gave them many functionalities. You have a, a priori investment. And then you, have, or you are attractive to developers. Your indirect benefit to consumers allow the platform to charge higher fees, but it's expensive to build. Just one problem you have in this area, and again, it's just illustrating how you can, can model this. 
Um, so in innovating apps, developers will usually use the functionality as is, if already provided by the platform. These are some circumstances usually an economist would uh, give to um, build a model, so this is more or less given, and consumers are application service users, and they benefit from the number of available applications on the platform. The more applications there are, the more attractive the platform is. Yeah? You would, I mean, you have many reasons to choose an iPhone or an Apple Android system, but in part, it's also dependent, or at least it was two to three years ago, which apps are available for both systems, right? And this is what this is here about. Then you have a design stage, a pricing stage, and an adoption stage. Again, the next thing you can think about, is it stable, your pricing? Or do I have to change or adapt my pricing in terms of where am I yeah, from design, pricing, or adoption stage? And here, through models, you get the slides. You can go through it. It's um, not that complex, but maybe too complex to really uh, discuss it here in detail. Here is the utility function for the platform simple model, which means that you have a platform that charges a flat fee to both market sites. This is indicated by PC times XC and by BD times ND, and you have to subtract the costs you have to invest a priori in your infrastructure. Yeah? This is how you would model this, and this is not an empirical research. People, it's not my research actually, <laughs> uh, People try to model things, and um, by reformulating functions, they try to find an optimum, for example, for, for a price. It's not really an empirical uh, way of looking at it. The same thing holds true for the developer utility. So the developer has an own develop, uh, utility function, and again, the consumer has one. And each one you can model, and then try to find out, you as a platform operator, when does one side benefit or not? And that makes it more easy to understand how you design your platform, how you have to invest in your platform. This was um, used for modeling Amazon Web Services. Again, I will not go too much into detail, but um, these researchers show the work. I see, I forgot to cite them, which I will um, do before I give the slides online. Okay, so our conclusion for this morning is, first of all, web entrepreneurship has different forms. Many characteristics of traditional entrepreneurship are present in web entrepreneurship too, as we can see, but in many areas it's also different. Web startups have the potential to turn established business upside down, and web entrepreneurship often involves two-sided markets, but they're quite difficult to price. What to do over the lunch break and in preparation for this afternoon? The question for the lunch break is, is the web a threat for media and TV companies? Here we have RTL Television, a quite big uh, company in Germany, you know CNN. So actually they have a two-sided model, right? So if you look, you get the things for free, Look, to, uh, except you have a pay pay-per-view, uh, something like this, or Amazon Prime or something, but usually the old model was you get it for free, and they charge advertising companies a lot to sell in the best time your advertising campaign. So this is how it works. And now we have the web. And RTL, for example, they for years avoided to bring their content to the web. My question would be, why? I mean, it's completely the same. Yeah, even if you think about um, IPTV, yeah, it's another technology behind it, but if I look on a television or on my screen, my, my monitor from my, from my laptop, I would look at um, advertising and would look my, my shows, but I could be able to um, say when I would like to look it. And this is why Amazon Prime is so successful with um, the series or Netflix and so on and so forth. Meanwhile, for a year about or something, they have RTL now, which is something which goes in this direction. So you can look serious or um, yeah, even movies sometimes, at least for a certain period of time, maybe uh, most of the time it's one week after um, it was shown on the main television channel. So there's something happening. And what we want to <laughs> to, um, you to do over the break is the following. 
So first of all, answer for yourself the question, is it a threat or is it an opportunity for the web company? And then try to model what is the value architecture, what is the revenue model of such a television company. And this afternoon, Harold will introduce the business model canvas. We will briefly try to use this framework to model the business model of such a television company. And then, and this will be quite interesting, you have about 30 to 35 minutes to think about the following thing. Is this business model canvas, which is heavily used by many, many firms to develop their business model, is it able to capture two-sided markets in web entrepreneurship? And if not, how can we extend it? This is our journey for this afternoon, supported and supervised by Harold and a little bit by me. Thank you for your attention and your questions and your remarks and, and your comments. And we'll see you at the afternoon. Thank you.